It's Monday, and that means it's time for a new episode of Interviewing People, the career cast where you can learn about a variety of careers from people actually doing the work. Today I'll be talking with Carrie Hallman, who once walked these halls and is now an associate professor of writing, rhetoric, and communication at Transylvania University of Lexington, Kentucky. Carrie will be sharing about her journey to becoming a professor and much more, so enjoy the show. Welcome back to another edition of the Interviewing People Career Cast. And today we have Carrie Hallman with us, and she is a 2002 Van Buren graduate. She's going to be talking to us about her career as the Associate Professor of Writing, Rhetoric, and Communication, and also Director of Seminars at Transylvania University in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. So she's going to be talking about how she ended up as a professor and what that looks like in case there are other people out there that would like to pursue that career. So Carrie, thank you very much for joining us today. And I'd love to hear just a little bit about your experience in high school. Did you think you were going to be a college professor someday or what were you thinking when you were still a student yourself? Good question. What was I thinking? Um, so actually, n- not really. I was always interested in English, and I knew that I was good at writing, and I enjoyed it, and um, I think even felt like, you know, I enjoyed helping people with writing pretty early on, but when I was in high school at Van Buren, I took actually a class at the University of Finley the um, anatomy and physiology class, which is not at all what I'm doing now, but was something else that I was really interested in at the time. Um, And I was part of the medical explorers program. It was something that the hospital had run at that time. No idea if that still exists or if it'd be called something else now. Right. Um, And got a lot of the kinds of narratives that I think people, students, high school students are still getting a lot, which is a like, get a job that you can sort of like imagine how the major leads directly to the job and that you know what your job's going to be and it's going to pay you well. Um, So I actually went, when I graduated Van Buren, I went to Wright State University and I started as a pre-med biology student in the honors program there. And I liked it all right. Um, I don't love blood. I don't love needles. And I actually couldn't vision for myself what it would look like to move into something within biology. I didn't, Wright State was a good school in a lot of ways. I did not have a relationship with an advisor as an undergraduate student. Um, I got paired with somebody who apparently never came to campus. So I didn't talk through, I think if I would have talked through this with somebody at that point, they probably would have helped me think about a way to make that major and the careers that it could lead to work, but I had always been really torn um, between pre-med and English. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to switch to English. Um, I love reading. I love writing. I love talking about reading and writing with people. So actually within my first year there, I switched to being an English major and I really loved it. The program that I was in had a couple different tracks. So you could do more of just a straight literature focus. You could do a professional and technical writing focus. And you can also do a creative writing focus. Um, And you still got a little bit of all of the other classes, but I ended up taking the professional and technical writing focus um, and graduated in 2006 with my uh, bachelor's. And I had started working in the writing center when I was at Wright State, actually somewhat serendipitously. Um, If you got a certain grade in your like first year writing classes, you just automatically got a letter from the writing center director saying, hey, you might be interested in working at the writing center. Um, And I was. So I started working at the writing center and realized I really, really liked working with people to help them flesh out their ideas and think about what, you know, arguments they wanted to make or stories that they wanted to tell. Um, We didn't do a whole lot of digital stuff then, but, uh, you know, Um, and so I knew that there were other people who were working in the writing center who were graduate students in a program at Wright State, and some of them were teaching some of the first year writing classes, and that really interested me. Um, So I started my master's program there, um, actually for three years, because I didn't start teaching the first year writing classes right away. I was still just working in the writing center, doing a couple other jobs. And when I realized I could teach, 
uh, I said, yes, I really want to do that. And so I didn't start that till my second year of the program. And you can technically teach for two years. So stayed for a third year, got a certificate in women's studies as well, um, and got some really good mentors in that program. Some of my faculty members who I think it was one of my first classes that I took in that program. I got a comment back that said, like, have you ever thought about PhD work? I thought, no, I hadn't. But if you're suggesting that my, I might be able to do it, that sounds great. So I started talking with that faculty member a lot. He helped me look at different programs that might be a good fit for me for the things that I was interested in, because I started getting really interested in digital technologies and literacies. Um, and actually Bowling Green State University, just up the road, has a really good program for that. And at that time they had, she's not there anymore, she's at Duquesne now, but um, a scholar in the field who is like profound uh, has published a lot. So I still got to kind of move right back up I-75 and go to Bowling Green for my PhD program. Um, I had looked at some other schools and there were some other really good ones, but that just worked out well. Uh, so I got my PhD from there and that was also, all of that was housed within English departments, all of my, my uh, bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD, um, but with some different tracks. So like I said, my undergrad was sort of focused on professional and technical writing. Then I realized I was sort of interested in teaching, so my master's was focused on composition and rhetoric. Um, and then my PhD was actually a similar name, except it was rhetoric and writing studies. Um, and all through my master's and my PhD coursework, I was also teaching primarily first year writing courses, um, and then eventually an advanced writing course. And I loved it. Uh, I knew that was what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to end up somewhere where I got to do some research and some teaching. Um, and so I'm now at Transylvania University, which is a liberal arts school. So there is that very heavy focus on teaching and forming relationships with students, having close relationships with them, you know, small classes, and, and we are the ones that do the advising, so I know all of my students really well, um, and that's how I got from there to here, but I, I didn't, it really wasn't until the end of my undergraduate experience where I knew that I liked the Writing Center, and I saw other people that were doing, you know, the graduate teaching, where they got to teach some first-year writing that I thought, let me, let me try that, um, it was not one of these cases where like, I know some folks who will tell me like, I knew from age 10 or whatever, I wanted to teach college. And it took me a little bit longer to feel like really secure that that was what I wanted to do. And I'm really glad that I did it. Good, good. Yeah, and I think that's interesting and good for students to hear that not everyone has it figured out when they leave high school and probably most don't have it figured out when they leave high school. So- yeah, I well, I was just going to say real quick, like, I think because I work so much with students in that transition from high school to college, I know the kinds of messaging that they're getting from parents, from the media, from all kinds of places. Um, just like, you should know what you're doing. You should go in and you should get on that track day one and go all the way through. And that does work for some people. It does happen that way. Um, but it doesn't happen that way for a lot of people as well. Now, if I did my math correctly, it looks like you spent about 11 years uh, in college to earn your undergraduate, your master's, and then your PhD. Yes. Did that ever feel overwhelming, or were there ever times where you questioned that, or did you just, you were into it and loved it, and it was worth it? I, I'll admit, I, am always, I have always been a person that enjoys school. Um, so, and also some of the messaging that I got was like, if you're going to go, just do it. Don't take time off because you won't go back. And I, I don't actually think that's necessarily the case. I know many people who did take some time off, whether it was a gap year between high school and college or after undergrad or whatever, um, who did end up going back into whatever, you know, educational path they were on. Um, but I, admittedly, part of the reason I did it was because I had that messaging of like, you got to do it or you're not going to. Um, so it, did it feel overwhelming? I, I guess I'm, I, I'm quite glad that I did go all the way through with it the way that I did. Um, and one of the things that I think helped me especially was that with the business and professional writing undergraduate track, we did a lot of work with organizations, whether it was like a local nonprofit or a school or a business. Um, and so I did feel like I was getting some outside of school, real world. I don't like that, but 
<laughs> that experience and sort of seeing what it was. Um, and I, he's my husband now, but we were, you know, dating back then. Um, and after he got his master's and it was a one-year program and then pretty quickly moved into, you know, the business world, he was in a nonprofit at first and then moved into some other marketing positions. So I always felt like I was seeing what some of these other paths could have looked like, you know, friends in different kinds of um, career choices. Um, and yeah, no, I, I always felt like what I did was the right way to do it for me. Right. Um, but again, yeah, I know several other faculty here and I have friends that uh that teach at other places that that wasn't exactly how they did it and so you can get where i am lots of different ways and i think that's good to remember too yeah there, yeah there are a lot of different paths to get to the same place so you talked a little bit about doing research as a professor and i know on your linkedin profile uh, you've collaborated on books as an editor you've written journal articles etc uh, how did you get started doing that, and what value do you see in doing that type of work? Yeah, so uh, on the one hand, it's a requirement, right? Like, if you are going to be a college professor, almost undoubtedly, you will be expected to do some research. There is a range of types of institutions, and they have differing expectations. So if you're at a research intensive, which we call like an R1 institution, your research is going to be your focus. It's going to be the main thing that your, you know, the people who are above you and get to say if you stay there or have to go find a job somewhere else, that's the main thing that they're going to evaluate you based on. Um, and I really like research and I knew that it was an important part for me because it helps I mean, I'm just curious. I'm really curious all the time to find answers to things. So research is my way of being able to do that. And that's for school topics as well as, you know, just like what daycare should my children go to and tons of research, right? Um, so I, I genuinely enjoy it. Um, it informs my teaching. That's really important. Like I am lucky I get to teach classes that are in my research area. Um, and so when I go to teach digital rhetoric or when I go to teach feminist rhetoric or when I go to teach business writing, like there, I'm constantly keeping up with what it is that's going on in those fields and what the latest scholarship is. Um, and that's important for me to be able to teach those classes well. Um, I mentioned before that I did want to end up at a school where teaching was more of the emphasis. So at a liberal arts school, research is required. Um, and that's good. I like doing it. Uh, but I knew that it wasn't going to be in the same way that there's the phrase of like publish or perish which within higher ed. Um, and it can be pretty cutthroat at some of the research intensive institutions. Um, you know, you have to have a certain number of books and articles and conference presentations and your, you know, citations have to be at a certain level that other people, you didn't just put the work out there, other people are actually reading it and using it. Um, and for me personally, I knew that worrying so much about that would detract from my ability to focus on the teaching as much as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so I have in the research that I've done, how I started doing it, because you asked about that as well, I have actually a project ongoing that started when I was in my PhD program with two of the people that I continually collaborate with. So while I was in that program, we started in one of our classes talking about, you know, the way that first year writing teachers and other writing teachers are trained to use technology. Think about it pedagogically, bring it into their classroom. Um, and like, how was that happening? What did that look like? What was that preparation? And we were getting preparation in my program that was really different from the stuff that we were reading about. And so we designed a survey to send out to other PhD programs to ask them, like, how are your students getting prepared? Um, and there again, like, we were just, we were curious. We wanted to know, are we really, a, like, is our program really as weird as it seems like it is when we read this other stuff? Um, and not weird in a bad way, but just like very different. And we ended up getting a way better response rate to that than most surveys do. I don't know how that happened. I think probably because we kept it pretty short. And it is something that was like, the people who were filling it out were curious what we were going to find out. Right. Um, and so that the trajectory of that research has changed quite a bit over the past 12, 11 years, but like I'm still working with the same two colleagues that I started that survey with and we've done some follow-up we've done recently, we got a 
a research grant in 2018 that allowed us to go actually visit some different um, universities that had digital writing within their first year curriculum. And we got to see like how the people who were teaching in that program were supported to do that work. Um, so it's still very much along the lines of the kind of thing we were curious about back in 2011 or whenever that was. Um, but then we've just like built on it and investigated it from some, you know, come at it from a new angle or sort of build on what we had originally been curious about 10 or 11 years ago. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I love how you talk about, you know, but it starts with your curiosity, which I think is really important. And then it has to be interesting to see some of the impact that your research has on other people and, and how is that making adjustments and, and making the world a better place. And uh, that that's really really cool to see you doing that and I try to encourage my my students and other students that hey create put your work out into the world we need to see your thoughts and, and you're definitely doing that and, and that's good for students to see you talked a little bit about uh, tenure and I hadn't really thought about talking about that but I, I think that is something that if someone wants to become a college professor that will be on that person's radar uh, I don't know from day one but very soon after day one, I would imagine. Can you talk a little bit about that process and where you are in that process? I'm tenured. I have made it over the hump of all of that initial <laughs> got to do the stuff and jump through the hoops and then, you know, wait for everybody to weigh in and see if they think you've met all of the different criteria. Um, yeah, I, what year was it that I received? I have my letter over here that I got from the university president saying like, you have been granted tenure and it was February, 2018. So it's been a couple years. Um, I, you know, there's a whole lot to say about tenure right now. Um, especially just very recently, some institutions really eroding the system of tenure. I don't know that students are super interested in that yet. And even if they got into higher ed, they wouldn't have to be yet. But I will be really blunt and just say, like, we are in a period right now where the very idea of tenure is sort of up in the air. Um, generally, when we talk about tenure, we're talking about job security, yes. But this idea that, like, college professors are meant to be provoking their students. They are meant to raise uncomfortable topics. Um, I talk a lot with my students about like, you know, they come in with the expectation that they should be comfortable in my classroom. We talk a lot about building sort of community guidelines on the first day. And I push back a little bit and say like, I, I'm never gonna put you in harm. I never want you to feel unsafe, but you will not always feel comfortable because we're gonna talk about really difficult, challenging topics. Um, and that's, really what higher education is about. And so tenure exists so that people don't have to feel as vulnerable um, to losing their job just because they bring up a topic that maybe somebody doesn't like. And I think that's a pretty big difference between high school teaching or any K through 12 teaching and college teaching. Um, and especially at a private institution like where I am. So it's a private liberal arts institution. But generally, process for tenure is the same if if the position there's lots of people who teach college who are not in a tenure track position um, that could be because they are just teaching a couple classes here and there at different universities and that would be called an adjunct it could be that they're in a part-time position now that there's all of these questions about whether or not tenure should even exist there are positions like you're a lecturer so you have some some job security, but it's not the same as tenure, and you don't have necessarily the same expectations to get to that point. Um, but so generally, if somebody is in a tenure track position, if they're thinking about wanting to be tenured, there are going to be three categories that they are evaluated on, and it will differ how important each category is and what the expectations within those categories are at each institution. Um, but it's teaching, research, and service. And so anybody going into a tenure track position will be looking at each institution that they're applying to to see if they're going into a tenure track job, what are the expectations here? And they should be very clearly laid out within the faculty handbook or somewhere else, the bylaws. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, it's even as specific as like 20% of your evaluation will come from teaching, 
50% of your evaluation will come from research and 30% will come from, so, I mean, that that is probably not, service is usually not <laughs> higher than teaching or research. That's right. pretty much always the sort of like third bottom thing that you're doing. And that includes things like being on campus committees and here doing advising work. That's not always part of the load somewhere else. Um, maybe interacting with like board members, kinds of like ad hoc groups that have to pop up here and there. Um, serving a, in an administrative role sometimes is counted as service. So there's lots of different ways that um, that that category may have been the one that was like least clear. I think most people probably know what research and teaching is. Right, right. Um, but yeah, like I said earlier, the research category, um, some places have really strict expectations, not only about how many publications you'll have, but the type of publications that you'll have. Um, and then the teaching category has a lot to do with like course evaluations. Um, you do, you know, a, a self-assessment and the packet that I submitted for tenure included things like my own self-assessment, which was several pages long, my CV, um, some sample materials that would show, you know, what my teaching is like. We get observed every single year in the classroom up until we get tenure. And so there's always at least two other faculty members sitting in on multiple classes and having conversations with you about your teaching and writing up a formal response that goes to the dean's office about that. And that gets put in this file that a committee looks at when you're up for tenure. Um, and then there were some representative materials about my research in there. And then you have to solicit letters from colleagues, but maybe not even people that you know, people in your field, people who maybe teach at a similar type of institution or do a similar type of research that you do, and they review your work and submit letters as well. And, you know, it was a couple hundred page long document that I submitted wow. when I went up for tenure. Um, and there's a committee that reviews that, and that's, you know, other colleagues here in different divisions and programs. Um, and then they make a recommendation to the dean's office, the dean's office makes a recommendation to the president's office, the president's office makes a recommendation to the board of trustees, and then you finally find out, you know, eight months later or whatever, did you get tenure or not? Wow. I, you know, I knew it was extensive. I didn't realize it was that extensive, uh, you know, a couple hundred page document that you're submitting and letters from other people. I, I had no idea that it, it was anything like that. So that's, that's really intense. interesting. And yeah, I had no idea that service also played a role in that. And I'm glad you explained that a little bit. Um, so a lot of really good information there. So now that you've been out of Northwest Ohio for a while, what do you miss most about living in Northwest Ohio? Is there anything? <laughs> Or do you love the hills of Kentucky? Dietz's? Can I say Dietz's as my answer? <laughs> the chocolate and the yeah. ice cream? Yeah, um, yeah that's yeah, fair. No, Northwest Ohio is a bit flat for my taste. Okay. Um, I did like being really close to Ann Arbor. That's a fun place to visit. And, um, well, you know, of course, I like a, a campus town. Right, um, right. I miss George House in Finley. Okay. That was my favorite <laughs> coffee shop there. And I think it's still there. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and you know, I didn't, I lived in Finley, not in Van Buren, but they're close enough. Um, you know, a lot of my family is still around there, so, but fortunately, I'm not too far away. I joke that I've just basically moved up and down I-75 for the past, however long it's been, since 2002, almost right. 20. Almost 20 years. <laughs> yeah, wild. Yeah, yeah. So, if you were uh, talking to another High, or a current high school student, and you were going to share with them the thing that you wish you had known when you were in high school that you now know 20 years later uh, in the middle of a career so forth. What is it that you wish you had known when you were in high school? There's so many things. Um, I think, and I tell this to my students, I do a lot of advising of first year students, so I kind of get them at the just barely past the point of your students. Um, travel abroad if you can. It is not out of reach entirely. Like I always thought it would just be way too expensive and I couldn't do it. And so I just didn't look into how to maybe get scholarships for that or what kinds of support were available. Um, and so I actually didn't travel outside of the United States really uh, until I taught a travel course in Ireland in 2015. And the experience myself from the faculty side, but also then just seeing my students there, um, 
I already before that knew that it was a big regret of mine that I never looked into study abroad, but that just really cemented it for me. So I've now like since then looked into being able to, I did an international week long seminar in Spain the year after that. And I'm fortunate that a sibling of mine lives in Switzerland. So like I get to travel to go, well, I have to slash get to travel to go see her. And I just, yeah, the, um, and, and part of it's my interest in language and literacies that the travel really allows me to kind of learn and have fun and explore what that looks like in different spaces. Um, but I think just, you know, uh, broadening my worldview was super helpful and um, you can do it in a way when you do study abroad that you can't do any other way. Uh, and I wish that I wouldn't have just, I think I saw a lot of things as barriers and just didn't push enough to try to, it, so that's maybe a more general piece, like the travel abroad is a specific example of it. Um, but more generally, like I sort of viewed things as like, well, I'll never be able to do that because I'm just, you know, a nobody and they wouldn't look at my application materials and want to accept me or, you know, that would be too expensive or just I, too many things made me shy away from even looking into whether things were possible. Right. Um, and so I wish I would have had a, a more just like something that my mom always says is like, why not ask? The worst that a person can say is no. And I think if I had had more of that attitude going into college and all the way through, um, I developed it a little bit more along the way. And I wish I would have had that a little bit earlier. Well, I think that's some great advice uh, to end on. And Carrie, I really appreciate you sharing your experience. If any students would want to reach out to you and learn more, uh, I'll, I'll link your uh, LinkedIn profile. Are there, is there any other way that they might be able to reach out to you? I will say I, I am on LinkedIn and I use it somewhat. It is not a space that I go often unless I'm teaching business writing and then I'm in there a lot more often. <laughs> um, but if they look for me on transy's, transy.edu is Transylvania's website. If they look for me on there, they'll find, even if they just Google my name, they'll find me. I think my transy page is probably the first thing that pops up. Okay. Um, so they'll be able to find my, my transy email and that's a good way to get a hold of me. Perfect. And I'm All happy right. to talk with anybody who has some questions. I mean, in a way that is my job. So yeah, I do it all the time anyways, and I'd be happy to do it. with Perfect. Family. Perfect. Well, I greatly appreciate you doing that uh, and being willing to do that and being willing to talk to me today and uh, good luck and have a good rest of your school year. Thanks. You too. Thank you for watching this interview with Professor Carrie Hong. I hope you learned valuable information from her career story. And to be sure you don't miss upcoming interviews, please click subscribe so you'll know when the next episode is released. Thank you for watching. And as always, remember the best part about Mondays is interviewing people.